All right, here we are with another episode of the High Ground, powered by Premier Companies. Good afternoon, Sal. Good afternoon. How are we doing today, Ryan? I'm wonderful. I am wonderful. Hey, we got Gary Calloway back at the podcast table. It's been with a while, us. Gary. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Gary guys. Was one of our very first ones. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. <laughs> he, he's lying. <laughs> he is. He told me this morning. I saw him in the. I saw him in his office. I was in the other closet over there, and and he goes, Sal. He said, I heard these were canceled. We weren't going to do it today. And I was like, No, that no, wasn't no. I think he heard wrong. Yeah, that's why the same thing he said to us. So Gary, uh, we've changed the format just a little bit since uh, you were here last time. We we'll right. start off with a question of the day. Mm-hmm. Your question of the day, Gary Calloway, is what is the weirdest thing you have ever eaten? Probably the weirdest thing for me is escargot. Okay. And I've only had it once. You uh, were a fan? I didn't say that. I said <laughs> I've only had it once. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a uh, clam or a snail. That's a snail. Yeah. Snail. Yeah. yeah. So that would definitely be the strangest thing I've ever had. How do they cook those? They boil them? It was uh, kind of a broil or something and, and stuff. Like I say, it, it, was, uh, it was quick. <laughs> and I didn't eat very many of them. <laughs> Full disclosure, I really like them. You, you've eaten oh, them too? Oh, yeah, they're so good. <laughs> I like them. I do like them. So. Anyway, but I don't think I really found out. I swallowed it so quick, I don't even think You I don't really even know whether you liked it or not. So it's like on a dare. Or you a have to bat. crack the shells? No, not the ones I am. Just dig them out. out. Of the, yeah. I'll slide right out of there. Yeah. <laughs> You, yep. just don't, you don't want to think about that part a whole lot, Sal. <laughs> Sal, what's the weirdest thing you've ever eaten? Well, mine, um, of course, we're redneck redneck Italians. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, squirrels were a pretty good part of our diet when we were younger. And um, that and pig's feet, mm-hmm. boiled pig's feet. Mm-hmm. But um, I'd say probably the weirdest thing, and it didn't seem odd at the time for whatever reason, but when your grandparents came out of the depression, I mean, it was you ate about everything. All this, so we'd eat squirrels and we would eat every part. I mean, even the head, grandma would fry that up, and even the brains in the so squirrel brains would probably be the mm-hmm. craziest thing that I've ever eaten. And Gary's nodding his head, so yeah, yeah. it wasn't uncommon years no. ago. No, you've had them too. Oh yeah, and you guys like them? It wouldn't be my first choice, but no, I wouldn't either. Yeah. But if you okay. put enough gravy on something, you can eat about anything. <laughs> yeah. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> Mashed potatoes and gravy, you want that. Okay. Yeah. Well, for me, it would be spiders. Oh. Uh, wow. Yep. On purpose? Yep. Mm. Yeah. And, no. and the face that you guys are making, appropriate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was very appropriate. I could describe the taste by the mustiest, oldest basement you've ever been in. Ugh. And the way that smells, that was how they tasted. Did you lose a bet? Not really, no, no. We just, no. The dare? I'm not. No, I'm. Uh, no, we were at a restaurant, and it, they uh, had it, it at a, a restaurant. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. paid for it. Yeah, we didn't catch them. I mean, they had them on the menu. <laughs> oh my <laughs> god. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, but yeah, we sure did. Were they yeah. like spider burgers or? Uh, no, they were just uh, individual <laughs> spiders. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's what they were. Yeah. So what and, country and they were, was they this? They were not in? good. They were not. What country? Uh, Bloomington. Gary, <laughs> <laughs> <So, laughs> do you have anything to say about no, that? I better leave that one alone. Purdue and IU <laughs> yeah, and all that. Say, I, I better leave that one alone. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, that's enough. So that'll be enough of those questions. I'd like to hear more of that later, <laughs> though. This, yeah, may, well, this well, might be its own podcast. Well, we may, okay, well, yeah. we can do that. We can do that. So we've got Gary here. Gary is... Uh, Gary is the VP of our Swine League division, and uh, so we're going to talk some about pigs today, even though Sal's kind of sucking up to you already, saying he eats pig's feet like he's <laughs> a huge market, like he's carrying the margin for it's you. So. Pretty, you only get so many feet off a pig, though. That's exactly That's true. <laughs> exactly right. That's true. So uh, we're going to kick it off today, and, and obviously we've had you, it's been a while, but uh, people mm-hmm. can go back and check out that episode to talk about our Swine League. Uh, division just a little bit, but when we need to finish, uh, right. farmers own the barns, we own the pigs, and uh, in certain situations, we we do own some of our own barns now as well as uh, with the merger with uh, White River Co-op. But um, so as we talk about animal husbandry, confinement livestock, we'll just get into some care with these animals a little bit. We'll we'll take it broad range. We'll even talk about markets here just a little bit and what we what we see 
from a global standpoint, exports, what we rely on from a marketing standpoint. So let's get back into bars just a little bit. And, uh, and we, we talk about what we were eating, strangest food that we eat. So let's talk mm-hmm. a little bit about the swine nutrition. Um, uh, let's get into our feed milling capabilities, how much we make, and then how do you land on those diets? Um, pretty much just different stages of, of the age and the size of the pigs. Uh, we, we feed a total of nine diets from the time they start till they're done. Uh, and it depends on the stage they're in. I mean, they each diet has got so much, you know, poundage that it covers and stuff. And so we stage them out to try to get the nutritional requirements as accurate as we can for that growth stage and, and keep them growing as fast as possible. So what changes through that? We think about how babies eat versus how adults eat and humans. You're doing a little different. You're doing a little different there. Texture's all the same. They're all handling the same texture for the most part, but... Nutrient wise, where you, where's your focus at the beginning towards the end? Well, I mean, obviously in the in early stages, we're bringing in pigs that are 12, 13 pounds, somewhere along in there. And the, the first diets that we feed are similar to baby diets. I mean, they've got a lot of whey products in them. They've got, you know, a lot mm. of like uh, milk, milk, yeah, milk type products or some of that there. So it's similar to a starter diet that a, a, a baby would have. Uh, and then they transition from that. As they start moving along, you try to look at what their lean growth capabilities are during that stage of their life and, and fit the nutrient requirements as accurately to that stage as they can. And as they get older, they lose a little bit of ability to gain lean muscle and they put on just a little bit more fat. So you try to keep the nutrition challenging them to put on as much lean gain as you possibly can. Uh, so that's why we use all the different stages. I mean, years ago, we didn't feed near that many, but you were either kind of overfeeding or underfeeding at different times. So we try to break that into as many stages as we can to fit it as accurately as possible and, and still be practical with, you know, without feeding so many that you can't keep track of that. So. Core-based diet, right, Gary? Yeah, right Indian. now it's especially core-based. I mean, we're not feeding any kind of byproduct, really. It's just a corn-soy type diet. And just What does that mean, core-based? Corn. Corn base. It's a corn oh, base, yeah, but, corn base. you know, we, we're not using any distiller's grain or fat at this point. Uh, we have in the past, but we're not right now just because of the cost and, and where it's at in the marketplace. So, so yeah, we're using a, a fairly basic corn soy diet uh, with uh, synthetic amino acids and stuff that supplement that, but uh, not a lot of other ingredients from the byproduct standpoint. Kind of micronutrients and things like that. Yeah, it's got a got a load of micronutrients. You've got trace minerals and vitamins and stuff in there to in all the diets to to keep everything in in line there. But a lot of that's proprietary, right? Some of it is. Yeah, I mean it's made specifically for us. I mean it's yeah. made out of the similar things that of what they make, but each one of them kind of looked at individually and and it fits into what we want with the way we're doing the processing and everything to to make that work for us at the mill. Do uh, how do you know when to change their diets? Uh, again, like I say, it's just mainly looking at their growth curves and looking at, okay. at you know how they're how much feed intake they are, and then you look at you know what the nutrient requirement is for the pig at that size, and look at the feed intake, and that kind of lets you formulate then what you need to have that the density of that, what you have to have in each one of those ingredients to match what the pig needs with the amount that they're eating at that stage of their life. Hmm. So you're weighing, weighing or just uh, visual? Yeah, you track kind of feed pounds kind of more both. Than pig I mean, pounds. yeah, we track yeah. feed pounds oh. and. And, you know, and, and there is some visual in it. We do not have scales in our barns, but people that are doing nutritional testing and researching are doing that on, on a, an actual weighted, okay. you know, way in that. And so we try to take what they've learned and adapt it with what we do and, and come up with the individual diets that, that are best steered for what we want to want to do on ours. Okay. Can they eat like all they want to eat? I mean, so basically they have access anytime they want to eat, they can eat. Right. Yes, they do. And the automatic waters and everything. There's a lot of room in these barns I've been in. Yeah, there's there's a lot of room. And it's one thing with Wean to Finish. You always think when these little guys come in, there's there's a lot of room. <laughs> yeah. They, you know, that's so they never they never leave there. They come in there as, yeah. a, as a, you know, small 12, 13-pound pig, and then they leave at about 280, you know, 275 to 285 right along in there. Um, so, yeah, it's there's a lot of room. And as they get up to the higher side, they're, they're getting snug, but then we start pulling the top ones out and, and start giving them more room then and, and, uh, and work that down. We take so a, how long do you keep? We what run, does it take? It takes about an average of 145 days or so. Uh, we'll start selling at about 135, and we'll usually be done by 155, 158. But the average, kind of the average of the whole group is going to run around 145, 146 days post-placement. Okay. Well, we got lots of questions. Far away. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what fascinates me is how clean. Um, yeah. I don't think. Um, 
we call you we we call you call the inside of the barn as a clean side, mm-hmm. and that's for the listeners. And and this was kind of new to me when we when I got started with Premier Ag. But the inside of the barn is considered clean. It is. Uh, where the entrance point of the barn is, we'll have a shower in. So everybody showers. It goes in, puts on separate clothes in the back. The dirty side is when you walk in the door. The clean side is after you go through the shower. And, and so it's it's two completely different zones. And there's a there's washers and dryers mm-hmm. on the clean side, which is inside the barn. Your shoes, nothing goes no, in. No, nothing passes through there. You, no watches, no nothing. It's a it's yeah, complete set of clothes and everything to function on the inside of the barn so you're not passing anything back and forth and, and trying to expose that. I think that's kind of neat, the, the length that you go to to keep all the pigs healthy. And even even from people, if mm-hmm. we might carry something in, we're making sure. And there's a there's fans that kind of blow out, so they have fresh air, but it blows the air out, so the diseases can't get in, right? Well, it draws it in the it draws yeah. it in to, to circulate through. So we don't have any filtration on our barns here. Now, some of our sow farms that we're involved in out in Illinois have got actually got filtration. So when that air comes into the barn, it's run through filters to try to to catch as much of that as we can. And then the air is expelled out. So, uh, but on the grow finished buildings that we've got here, we've not went to that extreme. Okay. Neat. So to get a, uh, let's go back to feed just for one second because we got we got away from that. But so how many pounds of feed does it take per pig to get them from thirteen to uh, two hundred and ninety pounds? Yeah, it's going to take between six hundred and fifty and seven hundred pounds. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, so let's let's you have uh, some some employees that are taking care of these, but mainly this is taken care of by the growers that own the buildings. Yeah, we have, you know, we, we kind of have two different situations. We Most of our production is done with contract growers, which, you know, is our patron partners that basically build the barn, um, and they're managing the barns and taking care of the pigs on a daily basis. Now, we have field men, and, and our people work with them on what needs to be done, and and go through and monitor what's going on in the barns as well, just to kind of give a second set of eyes to look at the pigs and see how they're doing and everything, and if ne- if things need to be adjusted. Um, but then we also do have now with the merger with White River, we do have some f- spaces on the western side of Indiana that are are actually ours that we have employees that take care of the barns in a similar manner. They're just they're employees instead of contract growers that that work independently. Let's talk about the time that it takes uh, in the course of a day. I mean, it used to, it was, it was a lot, but you were shoveling ear corn into feed grinders and all of that other stuff. So uh, what's a, what's an average length of time that a grower, if these pigs are somewhere in the middle? We're not talking loading or washing right. or any of that. Yeah, prob- day-to-day care. Probably a couple hours. A couple you hours know, a day. A couple hours a day is probably close. I mean, Again, it, it always it never fails the day you walk in there that you really kind of push for time and you need to get out. There'll be something broken. Something, and you something's have to broke. Do, so, right. you know, but on the average, probably a couple hours a day. Once you kind of get through the early stages and before you start selling, it's going to probably be somewhere in that two two hour, two two and a half hour range. See, I thought this business model was so good that I thought I'd have my wife. I'd build a couple of barns and I'd put my wife in there. But Gary assured me that there's more to it than just that, like her going out and feeding the pigs. But <laughs> Yeah. It's amazing yeah. how much um, how much visual. I mean, you, you're checking the pigs every day. I mean, somebody's yeah. got eyes on them every day, and you're in there every week. And uh, you keep we keep going back to the feed. I'll keep going back to the cleanliness. But when those pigs, when the hogs are sold and the barn is empty, mm-hmm. I didn't realize until I started here how how the whole barn was basically just power washed down. Yeah. Right. top to bottom yeah i mean we've got a whole process the inside the barn when they're built they've got sprinklers so once those pigs are cleaned out of there you turn those sprinklers on and it's just like a big fog i mean it just and so it dampens everything down and it softens all of the manure on the floor and everything up and then you'll come in with a with the power washers and completely clean and power wash all the floors all the gating side walls and everything uh, and then after you get that done and let it dry out, then everything's disinfected before wow. it comes in. So it's done every time in between each group. Well, I tell you, if the whole world did that kind of cut or care for their animals, we wouldn't have, you know, the disease outbreaks, right? I yeah. mean, that's why we're so militant about the process. Right, and it's our biggest challenge to success is keeping the pigs healthy. And, you know, so if we can get a healthy pig coming in and, and limit the exposure of that animal to people and to disease anything we could have in the air and stuff it, it's it's the biggest determinant of what our success is with them good 
So in the time that you're not in the barn, there's obviously monitoring going on uh, in that barn. So tell us a little bit about some of the technology that's in the barn. You've got bin sentries. You've yeah, got we, monitors or controllers. A couple of the newer ones that we've had, especially since we talked last time. I mean, we we first of all, the controllers, the newer controllers that we're using, uh, basically they're just mini computers. That control what? Uh, that control all the fans that draw air in and, and expose air or, or blow air out of the building. So they're controlling all of that. Uh, they automatically turn the feed systems on and off when they need to to fill the feeders. Uh, so they're they're doing all that. And in the summer when it's hot, they actually control the, the misters. So we, get, oh. we we dampen the pigs and then let a, let's shut them off so they can get some evaporative cooling. Uh, so they control all of that. So... That's, that's, and we can look at our phone. I mean, if you got a question about what's going on, you can pull that up on your phone and you can look and see what the buildings are doing no matter where you're at. I mean, as long as you got internet access, you can look on there and see what they're doing. You can actually go in and change settings. You can change temperature targets or change things, you know, on your phone if you've got access set up on that. So then the a couple of the newer ones that we've put in now, we do have, mon- in most of our feed bins, we have monitors that send us readings every, it, it mo- I think it pulls about every four minutes uh, on what is, is in the bin. It takes uh, laser beams that, let, that shoot in and tell us how much is in the feed bins and stuff. So you can look on the internet again, or you can look on your phone, and you can actually see what your feed inventory is in those bins and see what's going on there. Uh, so even when you're not in the barn, I mean... You can have an alarm go off that you've got a fan that went right. down. I mean, so you're right. never really, you don't, even when you don't have eyes on on yes. the pigs, you've got monitors and eyes on the pigs. Yeah. That yeah. is neat. Yeah. And, and that's a lot of the new technology. Uh, we just installed in basically all of them now. We have a new alarm system, you know, that is, again, wireless. You're, you're not dependent upon landline type phone lines and stuff. And it monitors the temperatures in there with the sensors and everything. And it, you can, again, go on your phone and you can look at all this. So that's been the biggest step in these things is it, you don't have to physically be in the barn to check all this stuff that used to. You'd get an alarm from the old alarm system, but you didn't know what it was. Wow. You just get an alarm that something was wrong. So you had to physically go to the barn to actually see and, and figure out what was going on. There's not a whole lot with the, with the technology today. We can usually kind of look and, and see what's going on you know, with it before you really have to get there and, and see how urgent it is or see what you may need to take with you to get it repaired. It's pretty cool. Even with the backup generators and everything else, I mean, we're set up for, I mean, it's set up to take care of the pigs. Everything, yeah. Yeah. Uh, power goes out, backup generators come on, and, mm-hmm. and things keep going. Yeah. That is neat. So let's talk about uh, hog markets just for mm-hmm. a little bit. I mean, so we're finishing these pigs out and we're selling them. Obviously, the intention is to make money. So what drives that market out there? And uh, I don't know how to ask that question necessarily to, to get to where I want to get, but what well, are we relying on? on why the is my side? bacon so expensive? There you go. There you go. <laughs> Sal, 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 ask it. Yeah. Well, everybody's it's thinking it. Oh, I'll ask be it. your problem. <laughs> your yeah. problem. I mean, there's a couple of different things. I mean, the marketing, depending on what kind of marketing system you're on, um, you know, the markets are going to gonna kind of look at demand, whatever the demand is for the meat products, and then whatever the supply of pork is or whether, whatever commodity you're talking about. And, and the markets are going to fluctuate according to what those factors are. The, 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 you know, the less supply there is, the more demand there's going to be, so the pricing is going to reflect that and vice versa. Um, right now, we're kind of in a situation where, you know, we're running just a tick higher on, on the hogs we're processing than what we had thought we were going to from the USDA estimates. Uh, so that's holding things down just a little bit. Uh, full anticipation that we'll, we'll cut back on supply just a little bit here in the near future, and that, that should help adjust things up a little bit. Um, now, to your question about the bacon, a lot of that, you know, like a lot of other things, I mean, a lot of that's determined by the processing, further processing costs, labor, transportation, you know, so different things that we're all seeing kind of some effects of the of the inflationary sure. things are affecting those type of things, too. And uh, yeah, so it's, that's it's not all up, right? of it by it's, any means, but that's certainly a factor that goes into it that's maybe making it look a little more elevated than what it used to. Yeah, it's not one thing. It's additive because right. even the transportation of the little pigs in and then exactly. every single step 
is, yeah. is added cost. When it's probably, one, probably one of the biggest things we're seeing right now is just, you know, in the last six months to a year, it's really become apparent uh, is how much cost we've been incurred in the whole system just because of what you're saying, Sal. I mean, it's not one thing. It's just an accumulation of a lot of factors that we typically don't have as variables. I mean, those have been fairly, you know, mm. pretty constant. And, uh, but they've really made some moves in the last year or so, and it's uh, kind of something new that we're having to deal with. Uh, you know, we can, we can do some hedge activity to help with grain prices and to help with soybean meal prices and, the, and some stuff like that with what we're selling, but um, you can't really hedge against those things. So these, these new costs are something we're going to have to learn to live with and, and kind of work around because they're, you know, they're definitely there and they are changing our cost of production quite a bit. Yeah. So if I was a young farmer and I wanted to get into agriculture and, and it's hard to get into row crop farming, mm-hmm. um, so this is a way that anybody could, I mean, if they qualify, obviously, but how would I, how would I start? I mean, how do I, if I wanted to, to build a hog barn and I have some access to land, how do I do this? I mean, probably the first thing I'd like to see, if possible, would be to, to maybe work in a barn for a little bit for someone else uh-huh. just to see. So you eliminate sure. everybody like me. <laughs> well, that I mean, you know, you're looking at today we're looking at a big capital outlay to do something. Sure. And so you, you would like to for someone to have at least had the opportunity to make sure this is something they want to do. Uh, you know, because once you pour the concrete and you build the barn, it's not as easy to, to change your mind on that as it is some things that maybe are not quite so permanent. So. You know that would be good. Um, the other thing is just say so you got to have access to land, but you also have to have some access to capital, and and that's that's probably something that's limiting a lot of people from the opportunity. Building cost it went up considerably and stuff, but still, when you look at different enterprises in a farming operation, a contract livestock facility is probably as risk as low risk as about anything that you can can look at because you're your income is pretty much determined before you start. So you kind of know what your income side is going to be and, and a good estimate of your expenses. Just like we were talking earlier, what can kind of get you is if those, if those expenses escalate at a rap, more rapid rate uh-huh. than what you were anticipating. But uh, for the most part, I mean, it's probably as lower risk side of, of any of the things you can look at. And so for a young farmer, if they can figure out how they can do that, uh, it probably offers them about as secure of opportunity of how to get started as most anything they can look at. Just back up just for a minute when we said access to some ground. That's Some people don't understand how much ground, though. Once yeah. they ah. start producing manure, they don't understand how much ground. So maybe you don't have to own it. But what's your recommendations as far as ground? To put that in perspective a little bit, it's shocking. It is. The, the size barns we're looking at now, you're going to need at least access to probably 250 to 300 acres and if you want to run a rotation of corn and soybean meals, or corn and soybeans, you're going to need to have access to five to six hundred acres okay. to really for run one that. barn of four thousand ish head. Right. Yeah. So yeah, and do a good nutrient plan. So I mean, you're not, you know, you're not overloading the ground. You're basically using what you're putting on by the by the crop. Uh, you need to be able to run that kind of acreage estimate to to get in that what you would have annually on the manure side. All right. That's all. I've got more questions, but we're probably going to hit a time. But Gary, your your business unit, the whole division, is a. Uh, we always get more questions on that than anything. I talked to some kids at the Brownstown uh, High School, and that always generates the most questions. Is the big so yeah. all the everything we do at Premier Ag? I think yours is the most fun that everybody has the most questions about. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Fun. I, I yeah. sit through those I, meetings every week too. Is that? I'm not sure that's the word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. It's uh, it's been a fun experience. We've had a good time with it. It's been very successful, and uh, in the livestock piece, it always is. Uh, uh, I've always been proud to be involved in in good animal husbandry and, and livestock production. So I think it's uh, I think it's just a it's a great thing for you to be here, and and uh, a lot of a lot of questions out in the world about what happens on the livestock side and animal production. So appreciate your time and I don't have anything else. Yeah, I'm, so. I don't have anything else. Thank you for the opportunity guys. Anytime. All right. Another episode of the high ground powered by premier companies. Thanks. Thanks Gary. Thank you.